Welcome to all our participants. Today's topic is glaucoma, sneak thief of sight. The objectives of today's webinar are number one, to be able to define glaucoma, number two, to understand the key differences between cataract and glaucoma, number three, to understand the basic pathophysiology of glaucoma, number four, to identify the risk factors for glaucoma, Number five, to recognize the signs and symptoms of glaucoma. Number six, to identify the major types of glaucoma. Number seven, to identify the key diagnostic procedures needed to diagnose glaucoma. And number eight, to identify the options available in the management of glaucoma. Today's speaker is Dr. Maria Imelda Yap Veloso. She is a magna cum laude graduate of biology at UP de Liman. She finished her medical school and residency training in ophthalmology at the University of the Philippines College of Medicine, Philippine General Hospital. She completed her glaucoma clinical fellowship at the Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, Boston, Massachusetts, Ophthalmic Consultants of Boston. This was followed by a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Harvard Medical School Shippens Eye Research Institute. Dr. Veloso is a past president of the Philippine Glaucoma Society and she is the director of the Glaucoma Service at the Asian Eye Institute, Makati City, Philippines. She is a clinical associate professor at the University of the Philippines College of Medicine and consultant of the Glaucoma Service, Centro Ophthalmologico Ocenizal, Philippine General Hospital. At present, she is chief of the Glaucoma Service of Rizal Medical Center. Without further ado, may we now call on Dr. Veloso. Thank you so much, Mackie, for that kind introduction. And for this afternoon, I'll be talking about glaucoma, the sneak thief of sight. Glaucoma is a group of diseases that damages the optic nerve or increase in intraocular pressure or IOP is a major risk factor. Now, this damage to the optic nerve leads to irreversible visual field defects and eventually blindness if uncontrolled. Now, the main structure that's damaged in glaucoma is cranial nerve 2 or the optic nerve. The optic nerve serves as a cable that transmits the images we see to the brain. Now, there are two major theories on how glaucoma uh, causes damage to the optic nerve from the high intraocular pressure. And the first theory is the mechanical theory where direct compression of the nerve tissue from the high pressure results in death of the ganglion cells. The other theory, the vascular theory, postulates that the intraneural ischemia results from decrease, results, resulting from decreased optic nerve perfusion um, is actually a sequelae of the compromised blood supply due to high pressure. Now, this that damage to the optic nerve causes blind spots or visual field defects. And what is unique about glaucoma is it does not affect central vision first. It affects the peripheral vision. And that's why it's actually dubbed the sneak thief of sight because it can go undetected until the optic nerve and the visual fields are significantly damaged. Now this is just an example of a visual field printout from normal to an advanced stage of glaucoma, just to show you what happens to the visual field in glaucoma. So first you start out with a normal field um, on top, and then you, uh, the next photo, you uh, develop a subtle peripheral visual field defects, and this becomes deeper and denser, encroaching on the mid-peripheral field, and in the advanced stage, you're left with a central tunnel vision. And this may eventually lead to blindness or total uh, darkness if it's uncontrolled. Now, globally, glaucoma affects 60 to 70 million people worldwide. It is responsible for 12% of global blindness, and it is currently the leading cause of irreversible blindness. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, we don't have local statistics yet, and we are currently working on this uh, care of the Philippine Glaucoma Society. Now, to understand what happens in glaucoma, you have to first know how the normal drainage system in the eye works. And just to orient you, 
Um, this the front part is the the pointer. The front part, the cursor, yeah, uh, is the cornea, and the lens is in the middle. And the cilia body of the eye. Uh, produces a uh, fluid, um, and uh, this is actually the aqueous humor which uh, continually bathes the eye, and this drains to a space which is actually the angle. Uh, I was just looking for a cursor so I can uh, show it. Yeah, there, um, and uh, that that space is actually the angle formed by the cornea and the iris here. And uh, after it passes through the angle, it drains out to the trabecular meshwork or the vascular and the vascular channels. Now to see it once again in another diagram, let's trace it. Let's follow the red arrow. So from the ciliary body, it goes on to the pupil, passes through the space, um, which is the anterior chamber angle. This is important because this space, the angle, is how the water access the drainage system, which is the trabecular mesh and outward towards the vascular channels. So if we were to make an analogy of the normal drainage system in the eye, you can uh, look at the open faucet with the water flowing through the sink. And if the drainage canal is open, it flows freely out. So this is how a normal drainage system in the eye should also be. Now, there are actually two major types of glaucoma if you base it on the angle status open angle, which is the more common, and angle closure glaucoma, which is less common but more urgent. So in open angle glaucoma, this is what happens. The water passes through the, from the ciliary body to the pupil, and it's able to access the drainage system because the space or the access angle to the drainage system is open. However, the block actually occurs in the drainage system itself. So the flow is still not efficient out of the eye. And if you use the same analogy again, uh, the water flows from the faucet to the sink and actually is able to reach the drainage pipes because the access space or angle is open, but the plug is actually in the drainage system itself. So that's for open angle glaucoma. Now in angle closure, what happens is the fluid or aqueous humor can't even reach the drainage system because the angle or the space that where you have access to the drainage system is actually completely closed. So water doesn't flow at all. So if you use the same analogy once again, the water flows from the faucet to the sink, but it's, it is unable to reach the drainage site because of that uh, mechanical obstruction from the closed angle. Now, these are the two major types, open angle and angle closure glaucoma. But Glaucoma can be classified in many ways. Most of the glaucomas we will see will come in adulthood, usually after the age of 40. But there are some rare forms, like congenital glaucoma, that comes uh, in the early years of life when uh, babies are born with a defective drainage canal. And because the eyeballs, tissues are still elastic at this age, the increase in intraocular pressure stretches the sclera, uh, enlarging the eyeball and uh, even the cornea. As you can see in this particular picture, the left-hand picture, you have a uh, enlarged left eyeball. This is an example of unilateral congenital glaucoma on the left side. Now, the next picture beside it is a patient with bilateral congenital glaucoma. This actually takes a longer time for the parents to refer this case because um, in the beginning, all they see are unusually large, attractive eyes in their child. It's only when other symptoms like uh, tearing or uh, photophobia and decreased vision develop that uh, they, begin, they begin to note that there's something wrong with their child. Now, juvenile glaucoma is also another type of glaucoma, but it comes in a, a later childhood years, usually after three, but before 20 years of age. Now, we also have secondary forms of glaucoma. I just want to give you some examples of this. Um, one is steroid-induced glaucoma. This is after the intake of steroids, either orally or uh, after topical application. And these are very dependent on the dose 
as well as the duration of steroid usage. There's also traumatic glaucoma, which is a secondary form of glaucoma that comes after injuries to the eye, either blunt traumas or penetrating eye injuries. And you also have lens-induced glaucoma, which are glaucomas that come from problems in the lens status, like in hypermature cataracts, you can develop a secondary glaucoma, or in dislocated lenses, it can also lead to secondary glaucomas. Now, deserving special mention is a type of glaucoma that some experts believe are a subtype of open angle glaucoma. And this is normal tension glaucoma. What makes normal tension glaucoma unique is you deteriorate from glaucoma and there is progressive optic nerve damage from pressure, but the pressure is in the normal range. So this is something that uh, is actually uh, different from the other types of glaucoma you will encounter. Now, who are at risk for glaucoma? So let's talk about the risk factors now. And we discussed earlier that the major risk factor is high intraocular pressure. Aside from this, important risk factors also include age. Um, after the age of 40, the risk for glaucoma increases more and more a family history of glaucoma, African and Chinese ancestry, nearsightedness or farsightedness, the use of steroids, eye trauma or surgery, thin corneas, and other systemic diseases. Now for the symptoms, generally there are none. And let me explain this. In the open angle glaucoma, usually there are no symptoms in the early and moderate stages because there is a gradual increase in the pressure inside the eye. So the eye is able to adapt to this increase in pressure. Now, in angle closure glaucoma, however, especially in the acute form, there is a sudden um, block or closure of the angle, so the eye cannot adjust to this high pressure that comes suddenly, so there is blurring of vision, eye pain, headache, nausea and vomiting, and because of a swollen cornea from high pressure, rainbow colored halos around lights. Now, this is just an example of a patient that presents with acute angle closure glaucoma. Here you have a red painful eye, and aside from this, because the cornea is um, swollen from the high pressure, it's hazy, and you also have a mid dilated pupil because of a damaged iris sphincter from the high pressure. Now, glaucoma, regular and complete eye exam is recommended. And it should be stressed that glaucoma screening that only checks pressure is not sufficient to detect glaucoma. We've already mentioned that there is a special type of glaucoma called normal tension glaucoma, where the pressure may be normal, but the patient deteriorates from glaucoma. And this is the reason behind this particular statement. Now, in the comprehensive eye examination, we have to pay special attention to certain points in the examination that will help us diagnose glaucoma. These are the optic nerve examination, which we can do through ophthalmoscopy, eye pressure measurement, that we, is actually called tonometry, and angle evaluation, or the internal drainage evaluation, which is called gonioscopy. If any of these specific points in the examination are positive for uh, the suspicion of glaucoma, Ancillary tests like an optic nerve scan, which is like a CT scan of the nerve tissue, and visual fields, which measure the peripheral vision, should be done to confirm the diagnosis. So we'll be going to this test one by one. So for the optic nerve assessment, we can either use our direct ophthalmoscope to assess the optic nerve, but most ophthalmologists use the slit lamp with a 90 diopter lens to get a more stereoscopic view of the optic nerve. Now, what we're actually looking for in optic nerve assessment is the cup to this ratio. And just to give you a diagram, the cup is the pale area in the center of the disc, and it's also delineated by the bending of the blood vessels. And patients are labeled glaucoma suspects when their cup disc ratios are 0.5 or more. The photograph on your right shows a cupping of about 0.6 to 0.7, which makes this patient a glaucoma suspect. It's just another example. The left-hand photo shows a normal optic nerve with a cupping of about 0.3. And the photo on the right shows you an optic nerve cup this ratio of about 0.7. This is an eye with glaucoma already. 
Now, this just tracks what happens to the optic nerve over time when the glaucoma is uh, uncontrolled. So first you start with a normal optic nerve with a cup this ratio of uh, 0.3. And uh, over time, it gets larger, uh, especially the vertical cup this ratio. And in the third and fourth photos, I don't know if you can see the disc hemorrhage on the inferior nasal side. These are actually warning this is actually a warning sign that the glaucoma is worsening if you see a disc hemorrhage. And over time, this cup enlarges and can sometimes uh, obliterate the neuroretinal rim completely. So the other important test in glaucoma is tonometry. Here we measure the intraocular pressure. And if we don't have the diagnostic tonometers available, uh, an estimate of the pressure would be to do finger palpation where we ask the patient to look down and using the second finger uh, of both hands, yes, simultaneously we press downwards. If it's soft, that's normal pressure usually and it's like the tip of the nose and if it's firm, uh, it will be similar to like touching your forehead, that's high pressure. Uh, luckily, we now have the tonometers available which are more accurate and actually the gold standard is the one that's being shown here, the Goldman Aplanation Tonometer, where we have this conical instrument um, that indents the cornea, and the force needed to indent the cornea reflects the pressure inside the eye. Now the normal pressure range is from 10 to 21, and anything above 21 is considered abnormal. Now it has to be also emphasized that eye pressure is the only treatable risk factor up to this point in time. And all current treatments are designed to lower eye pressure. Now, gonioscopy uh, examines the internal drainage canal. So it tells us whether we are dealing with an open angle or angle closure glaucoma. Just to give you an idea, this is what we see in an eye, uh, the angle of the eye using that lens. Uh, uh, in the lower portion is the pupil, the iris, and in the upper section uh, is the uh, cornea. And if you look at the left-hand side of the photo, uh, we have the ciliary body band and the trabecular meshwork, the second pigmented band. Those are the angle structures with the scleral spur, that white band in between. If you see those structures during your gonioscopy, then the angles are open. As you move from left to right, you see that the iris is adhering to the angle structures and you actually lose angle structures in the right-hand side of the photograph. Uh, this tells you that the angle is closed on the right-hand side of the photo. Now, if one of your tests, as I mentioned a while ago, is suspicious for glaucoma, then we have to do some ancillary tests to confirm the diagnosis. And one is the OCT nerve scan, which measures the thickness of the nerve tissue. This is the printout on the right-hand side. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have the pointer, but the left-hand uh, photo shows some uh, red... Uh, in the red areas in the upper and lower quadrants of this uh, circular uh, printout. And this denotes that there's thinning significantly of the optic nerve in the superior and inferior quadrants. While the right hand photo of the optic nerve, it's all green. That means that the nerve tissue is within normal thickness. Yeah. It's within the normal thickness. Now, another important test that we use to confirm the diagnosis of glaucoma is perimetry or the visual field examination. So um, this is a printout from the visual field and the upper right hand photo of this printout gives you the gray scale. The dark areas correspond to the areas that the patient cannot see. If you uh, direct your attention to the right hand lower um, printout, this uh, the clustering of the black points here in the superior field confirms that there's loss significantly in the superior field of vision of the patient. So the overall goal of treatment in glaucoma is to reduce eye pressure to target pressure. So what is this target pressure? Target pressure is the pressure level at which no further glaucoma damage takes place. And target pressure is different per patient because it depends on several important factors. It depends on the uh, one, the uh, um, baseline pressure of the eye. It depends on the severity of glaucoma or the stage. If you're in the severe or advanced stage, we are more aggressive in getting a lower pressure. Uh, also, 
uh, it also depends on other risk factors the patients may have. It should be noted that target pressure is something that's dynamic, so we adjust it accordingly based on the patient's response to treatment and on the stability of the patient's test over time. Now, the treatment of glaucoma follows a stepwise approach where we start with medical treatment first, followed by laser treatment and surgical treatment after. But just a point of emphasis, in patients with angle closure glaucoma, because the angles are damaged, laser and surgical treatment may need to be, do be done sooner. So again, for medical treatment, this is our first line, and we're lucky now because in the last two and a half decades, uh, several classes of medications have been developed for glaucoma. So we now have a lot of options to choose from. And, and the medications available actually work two ways. They may either increase the outflow of fluid from the eye or decrease the fluid production inside the eye. Now, if medical treatment fails to control glaucoma, uh, laser treatment is done. And an example for open angle glaucoma of the laser we do is selective laser trabeculoplasty, where laser energy is directed to the drainage system to stretch the pores in the trabecular meshwork to allow more fluid to flow out. For patients with angle closure glaucoma or those at risk for angle closure glaucoma or what we call narrow angles, uh, a laser iridectomy or bypass canal uh, in the iris is done. And if this is not enough, sometimes another laser called iridoplasty where we put contraction burns. Uh, these are the green spots, light green spots on the peripheral part of the iris that we apply in order to pull the iris away from the angles and to try to open the angles of the patient. Now, if medical and laser treatment fails, then the next step is surgical treatment. And the gold standard is trabeculectomy, or glaucoma filtering surgery. Here we create a conduit that connects the anterior chamber to the subconjunctival space in order to bypass the damaged drainage system. So the water, uh, passes from the anterior chamber and we make an opening in the sclera uh, and then the water drains to under the conjunctiva in the superior part of the eye. Now, the main um, cause of failure in trabeculectomy is scar tissue formation. So if the trabeculectomy fails because of scar tissue formation, uh, another option would be your glaucoma drainage devices or your tubes where you put an implant um, that connects the anterior chamber with a subconscious tidal space to a plate where the fluid can drain out. This is also useful in patients that had previous surgeries and have a lot of scar tissue already. Now, at this point, I just want you to be uh, more familiar with uh, frequently asked questions from patients and friends and some entities that are currently linked to glaucoma. So one um, common question we get from patients, um, or what would be the major differences between a cataract and glaucoma. So just again to review, um, for the cataract, the main structure affected is the normal crystalline lens that becomes cloudy, while in glaucoma, the main structure affected, as we mentioned earlier, is the optic nerve or cranial nerve number two. Now for the uh, vision or symptoms for glaucoma, although there are no symptoms in the early part of the disease, uh, it affects the peripheral vision, so what it looks like is something like this when you have moderate to advanced glaucoma, you lose your peripheral vision. For a patient that has a cataract, uh, the description of the visual loss is a generalized cloudy vision because you're like looking through a window which is cloudy because of the cataract. And third, for the type of uh, visual loss for the cataract, it's a reversible form of visual loss. Once you remove it and replace it with a intraocular lens implant, you reverse the visual loss in a patient with a cataract. In glaucoma, however, the visual loss is irreversible, so you also have to keep in mind that treatment of glaucoma does not cure it. It just controls the progression of the disease. Now, the second entity that's uh, closely related also to glaucoma, and many patients also ask about it on their readings, is caffeine. Um, it has been shown that um, consuming large quantities of caffeine, usually five cups of coffee a day, can increase the pressure from one to four millimeters mercury from baseline. But overall, the studies still show that caffeine intake is not associated with an increased risk of glaucoma. 
Now, marijuana is another entity that is uh, currently related to glaucoma because uh, of the legalization of the use of marijuana in some states in the U.S. and in other countries, as well as studies that show that marijuana either taken orally or inhaled can lower the pressure for three to four hours. There's been a lot of speculation in its use for glaucoma. However, the studies still show that there's lack of evidence that its use can alter the course of the disease. The stand of the American Academy of Ophthalmology on the use of marijuana for glaucoma treatment is it's not recommended because there are safer options such as medications that are available and efficacious. Now, there are also activities that may be linked to an increase in pressure. And one is a very uh, popular exercise, which is yoga. It has been shown that certain positions in yoga, like headstands, and I think this is the downward facing dog position, uh, can increase the pressure significantly. So since studies are still ongoing, glaucoma patients should avoid these particular activities. Another activity is also weightlifting, especially of course if the load is very heavy. Now to summarize, Glaucoma is a group of eye diseases that damages the optic nerve where the major risk factor is an increase in intraocular pressure. And it should be emphasized that until this point in time, intraocular pressure is the only treatable risk factor for glaucoma. Two, a comprehensive eye examination with the necessary ancillary tests are essential in the diagnosis of glaucoma. And because of certain forms like normal tension glaucoma, there is no single diagnostic test that can detect glaucoma. Since glaucoma causes permanent optic nerve damage, visual loss is permanent. There is no treatment that can recover the vision that was lost from glaucoma. And treatment aims to preserve whatever vision remains. Four, regular follow-up is crucial since this is a lifelong disease and it is not cured, but it can be controlled. I'd like to end by saying glaucoma is a sneak thief of sight because it may steal precious memories from you, not of what was but what is to come. So early detection and management is key. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, very insightful lecture, Dr. Yap uh, We now have 83 logged in to go, go to webinar and we have 15 participants through live streaming. We would like to thank today Today's sponsor, uh, Santen, and our media partners, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and the Filipino Doctor. Uh, before we proceed to our Q&A portion, let's have one of our panelists give her reaction. May I introduce our reactor, Dr. Dr. Marie Antoinette Eltonal Pascual. Dr. Eltonal Pascual is an, is an intermed graduate of the UP College of Medicine. She did her residency training in ophthalmology and a fellowship in cornea external diseases at the Department of Ophthalmology at, Philipp at the Philippine General Hospital and the Institute of Ophthalmology. She's a member of the Board of Examiners of the Philippine Board of Ophthalmology. She was a past chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Hospital ng Maynila Medical uh, Center. And she is a she is a council member of the Philippine Academy. Was a council member of the Philippine Academy, uh, Philippine Academy of Ophthalmology. Currently, she is an associate professorial lecturer of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Pamangkasan ng Lusod ng Maynila College of Medicine. She is also an ophthalmology consultant at the Hospital ng Maynila Asian Hospital Eye Referral Center and Peregrin at the Peregrin. May we call uh, Dr. Elton Alpaswan. Thank you, Gary, for that kind of introduction. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like to say thank you to the, my classmate, my beautiful classmate, Dr. Marimalia Velos and for being late so that I was able to sing earlier. <laughs> um, okay, so my reaction basically to your lecture, Marimel, is <clears throat> just to point out the three key points that you, that you also emphasized in your lecture. 
First, that optic nerve damage due to glaucoma is irreversible. So when the doctor catches you at a certain point, whether it's early, middle, moderate, moderate or severe stage, whatever damage has been inflicted on your optic nerve by the disease cannot be reversed anymore. You can only, at, at the best, stay the way you are and not get better. In other words, you the best for us doctors to do is to prevent further progression of the disease. Therefore, early detection really is the key in the treatment of glaucoma. And as Dr. Veloso Yap has also Yap Veloso has emphasized, most glaucoma is asymptomatic because the central vision that remains is usually good, usually stay at 2020, except that the fields are narrow. So, the f louder, I'm told to talk louder. <laughs> okay, so the fields are narrow. So, um, sometimes you have patients who just keep bumping on the sides, or they drive a car and they, they keep side swiping other cars, you know, because the central vision really is maintained. And, and the, the, the vision just keeps contracting and contracting until one day only a tunnel remains. You know? that, which is why most of the patients really are asymptomatic. Um, this is why when I was a past counselor of the academy, we came up with um, an information poster which we had uh, 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 printed in several uh, broad broadsheets no? and magazines on the must knows about proper care and prevention of blindness. And uh, number eight of the ten is that certain blinding eye diseases like glaucoma have no signs or symptoms. Therefore, everyone, I repeat, everyone should consult with an ophthalmologist once one reaches the age of 40, okay? Because again, glaucoma is mostly asymptomatic and um, it will take a doctor to look into the inside of your eye, to take a look at your optic nerve, to tell if you are a suspect for glaucoma or not, and to conduct further tests to um, definitely say if you have the disease or not. So since this is uh, my, my last webinar, I would just like to take the chance to point out the other points in this um, must-knows about proper eye care. So first, if you will allow me, Dr. Yes, Gary. Course, oh, thank you. <laughs> Number one, if you are a childbearing age as a woman, you need to have yourself vaccinated against rubella before six, at least, at least six months before you get pregnant because if you get rubella or German measles within the first trimester of pregnancy you will get rubella syndrome. Your, your, your infant will be born with congenital heart defects, hearing defects and congenital cataracts. You know? So uh, even sometimes if you've had rubella vaccination as a child sometimes um, you really need to repeat the dose because you're not sure if that vaccine was, um, uh, if you, your body took to that vaccine. The second point is children suspected of having errors of refraction, you know, those children who need eyeglasses, should be brought to the, the eye doctor for refraction and screening for possible amblyopia. So if your child watches TV too closely or squints, when he's looking far or has frequent headaches, that might be a sign of that the child needs glasses. At child age, at school age, you need to have him or her refracted to prevent functional blindness or amblyopia or lazy eye. Third point, um, you should wear uh, ultraviolet protected sunglasses when exposed to the sun to prevent cataracts and age-related macular degenerations and to rejuve. Number four, avoid over abuse and overuse of the eyes. So don't do activities like reading at the dark 
or reading in a moving vehicle, okay? And then when you're on the computer for a prolonged period of time, your blinking decreases so your eyes get dry. So you need to rest periodically when you're using the computer. This is the number five is very, very uh, common sense. Avoid work and play related eye injuries. Do not make your children play with pellet gun, pellet guns, or, uh, or if they're not old enough, darts, or even very, very sharp pencils because we've seen, or uh, run around with barbecue sticks at the parties because we've seen so many, many injuries like this. Um, if you are a carpenter or you work around the house, wear protective goggles because I cannot count the number of times I've seen foreign bodies and nails enter the eye because of uh, carpentry work. Number six, traditional practices like dropping herbal extracts, breast milk, and urine on the eyes, which are still being done up to now, may be harmful and must be abandoned. If you need to uh, drop something on your eyes to clean it. You can wash it with clean water, you know, or um, use artificial tears. But other than that, if your eyes are red, if you feel anything, uh, if you feel like it's something's wrrong with your eyes, best to consult an ophthalmologist. Number seven, if you control blood, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and your blood cholesterol, you will have have had eliminated at least 50% of all eye illnesses because hypertensive retinopathy, atherosclerotic retinopathy, and diabetic retinopathy would have been um, uh, avoided no, or prevented. So this is also the same for your body. Just control your blood pressure, blood sugar, and blood cholesterol, and you'll be okay. Okay, so um, as we said, as we have been repeating, most glaucoma is asymptomatic, but in my practice as an ophthalmologist, I'm not a glaucoma specialist, but when patients come to me with the following signs and symptoms or history, I am very careful and try to look if there are suspects for glaucoma. So headaches of unexplained cause, not migraine, not tension, they just have headaches at certain times of the day, would be a sign that their pressures are increasing. Iridescent vision, which, caused, which is caused by um, the cornea becoming edematous because of the pressure. Uh, this is, uh, you see it as halos around the light or rainbows. When you look at the light, there's a rainbow around it or a halo around it. That can be a sign that your um, eye pressure is going up, even if you don't feel anything else. Family history of glaucoma. I think the Clara Marimel will agree if you're, there's family history of glaucoma, then you have to be really checked for it as well because this is one of the risk factors. And then again, tunnel vision because everything can disappear around. You know, the periphery of your vision can be contracting, but the central is still okay. So it's like a tunnel and you keep bumping into things on the side. So that's a possibility that you have uh, glaucoma. Okay, so you need to go see an ophthalmologist if this, if all of this, if you have all of this, even before the age of 40. But definitely when you reach the age of 40 and you need to start wearing reading glasses already anyway, then go to an ophthalmologist at least once in your life to make sure you don't have glaucoma. The problem is, Okay, and this is the second part of my reaction. This part is um, aimed for general practitioners and MDs out there who are looking to serve the, the countryside. A study done by a resident of mine, Dr. Ajay Koresma, on the geographic distribution of ophthalmologists in the Philippines for the year 2014 revealed the main addresses of ophthalmologists throughout the countries, throughout the country, and found out that 83% of ophthalmologists are in Luzon. And out of that, 53% are in the national capital region. Only 8.3, 8% are in the Visayas, and only 8% are in Mindanao. 
So you can imagine how maldistributed uh, ophthalmologists are throughout the country. This is the, these are the provinces in the Philippines without ophthalmologists. So there's Batanes, Ifugao, uh, Northern Samar, Polo Sulu, Sarangani, Zamboanga. I used to go to Romblon, but I didn't stay the whole the whole time. I would just go uh, three or four days a week and then come back. So that was not my main clinic. And it wasn't really, although I helped a lot of people, it wasn't really enough because if patients have an accident in the middle of the month, they would still have to come to Manila. And it's very difficult. They have to take a 10-hour boat ride to Batangas and then take a two-hour bus ride to Manila. So um, they would rather wait uh, five hours for the doctor in the clinic than take somebody, a member of their family, leave their families behind, leave uh, their livelihood, and come to Manila, pay for board and lodging, pay for the doctor, pay for the food, um, just to be able to see an ophthalmologist. So you can imagine if, if we at least serve these areas, a lot of people wouldn't lose their livelihood for that period of time that they're uh, having their checkup. So, uh, for example, my do my daughter used to, to uh, joke me and tell me, Mom, why do you have to leave me? I'm your daughter. Why do you have to leave me? I'm more important to you than your patients. And then there was a point in time that I really had to find a way to explain to her. So my way to explain is, you miss me so much when I leave you. Imagine... 50 mothers being missed by 50 daughters because they have to go with their husbands to Manila to have their husbands check. After that, she was able to understand. So, so this is the place I used to go to. This is Tablas from Lon. It's located in the heart of the Philippines, right in the middle. In some maps, it's not even there. Lon is not even there. It's very hard to go to. It's not really small, but it has a population of around 200,000 plus. No? Um, this is their equivalent to Manila Bay. Okay, so, and uh, the beaches are so clean in that bay that the children use it to play around and they actually swim in it. It's not toxic at all. They, they really use it for, um, for, uh, for family bonding, you know, spending time. And I used to, we, go, we used to go to the shore with my daughter, when, when she, there was a time she, I could bring her already. Uh, she'd wait 10 hours at the clinic just to catch this, the sunset and we would eat fish balls by the sea. So that, that is a big thing for me. At least I gave her memories with that. But here's the thing. In that province, they do not have cardiologists, radiologists, endocrinologists, orthopedic surgeons. We have meds, neurosurgeons, or gastroenterologists. So patients who need dialysis, you can just imagine, they have to come to Manila every, what, five days, every week at the very least, <clears throat> to be able to have their dialysis done. They don't have a 2D echo. There are so many patients there who are post-stroke who do not have uh, any rehab doctors to go to. And there, there are no endoscopy units there. So for those family physicians who are uh, looking to serve the countryside and um, help others as well, uh, you can please consider Romblon. It's also a vacation because the beaches are so beautiful. So it's like a monthly working vacation for you. You can bring, you can bring your wife. It's like a weekend date. You can do an endoscopy for all the patients needing it and then come home. And you will be able to help the people there. Uh, you know, it's, it's like a pot of gold. The more people put their hands in it, the bigger it grows. Because as, as doctors, that need to fulfill our, our um, vocation of service is, is, uh, uh, is being fulfilled. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Tom, Tom for that, um, for the, especially for the tips that you gave about um, general eye care, and of course for highlighting the concerns of the maldistribution of eye care in the Philippines.
Um, we actually have a comment. Uh, comment. We actually have a comment that there's a doctor that goes to uh, there's an ophthalmologist that goes to some Buang Kasi Bugay oh, okay. on a monthly, uh, monthly basis, basis, I think, for cataract mission. So uh, we didn't put the name of that doctor, but uh, we congratulate that person. That's true. But um, anyway, we have a, we're going to our question and answer. So um, we'll have, there's a question here. Are there medications um, that are contraindicated for glaucoma or cataract? I suppose they're also asking if there are medications that cause cataract in glaucoma. Okay, for the medications that cause cataract and glaucoma, uh, steroids are number one probably here because they they both cause cataract and glaucoma. Now, uh, for medications to treat cataract, uh, we don't usually give medications for cataract because there's no uh, medication that has been shown to help stop retard uh, or uh, slow down the cataract. So, uh, for glaucoma, in terms of uh, the complication, uh, contraindications for the use of glaucoma medications, um, we have different classes to choose from, but we also have a beta blocker class. So, just like any beta blocker, uh, contraindications would be uh, asthma and heart problems, like especially AV blocks or radicardia. Um, most of the other uh, eye drops, though, it's more of hypersensitivity. Um, more minor, you uh, the assigned fix. Yeah. Okay, so um, going back to the steroid, uh, it's a common medication nowadays, and uh, does it really matter if it's um, when we say steroids, are oral steroids or inhalational? Um, do you have any? Uh, would you like to comment whether one is worse or both? Both can cause glaucoma. I think both both cause glaucoma. It really depends on the load of steroids you receive, like, and also the duration. Um, if it's given, like, if it's a topical application on the skin, like, just a small area, I don't think it's going to make much of a uh, put you at risk for glaucoma. But let's say you, like, for sore eyes, some patients they self-medicate. They it's such a wonder drug that it removes the redness. That sometimes they even use it after that, and that's when it starts when you keep using it, and the duration becomes. Like more, more than two weeks, the risk becomes much more. Yeah. So there. So steroids by itself, they're not actually very. They're not dangerous, but they should be used appropriately. Otherwise, they can cause glaucoma and they can cause cataract. They are very important medications uh, for particular diseases. We have a question here from uh, Doctor Tina Camera, your classmate. Hi, Tina. Um, anyway, is it safe to prescribe? Glycopyrrolate, an anticholinergic that they prescribe for some cases of, of hyperhidrosis if someone has a personal or family history of glaucoma. Mm -hmm. I suppose this is, uh, is this oral? Yeah, it's Probably it's oral. oral. Um, I'm not very familiar with the medication yet. So um, there are many medications, but it may because it's an anticholinergic and yeah. It, Sort of, a, yeah, counters one of our classes of medication, which is a cholinergic medication that's fine according. So there may be there may be a contra, contra, contraindication, or but I'm not very familiar and I'm not aware of studies that have yeah, uh, evaluated this in relation to glaucoma or contraindication to medications for glaucoma. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. So yeah, so Tina received your answer. Yeah, I'm satisfied. Yeah, she's a derma in Chicago. Anyway, let's see. There we have any more questions here? Hi there. Um, this is Dr. Takanai. I would like to ask about routine cataract surgery, which is more cost effective or more advice, an extra capsular extraction. Or an intracapsular extraction, and what are the indications for each? This how you the oracle. So I suppose this is a question for you. One of your intracapsular. We don't really do that anymore. 
there are very, very little indications for intracapsular catalysts. Maybe you're talking about fake co-emulsification versus an extracapsular catalyst. So extracapsular, you basically can remove the whole nucleus as a whole, whereas uh, fake emulsification, ultrasound waves will uh, fragment the nucleus, so you, you need a smaller incision to remove the cataract. Usually you don't need sutures anymore. So uh, both are safe in the hands of, uh, of an effective surgeon. You just really have to uh, talk about the, the dangers and uh, the pros and cons of each surgery. Okay. Dr. Eric Dakana is also a singer. Singer, oh. Okay. He's a professional singer and pianist. I think he's a family man or occupational man. That's it. So I, if there are no more questions, we'll... Okay. So um, thank you again uh, for that comprehensive discussion on glaucoma, Dr. Yakudoso and Dr. Elton Alpasquad, Marimel and uh, Tonton. To summarize, uh, they have, I, they have uh, defined what glaucoma is, uh, how it happens, and its signs and symptoms. Our speakers have discussed the different types of glaucoma thoroughly. The diagnostic procedures appropriately diagnosed glaucoma were identified and explained, uh, such as nerve fiber OCT, perimetry, and the like. It has been discussed that management of glaucoma is personalized and may range from topical medical treatment to laser and also to surgery in an effort to lower intraocular pressure. Now, again, although glaucoma can cause irreversible blindness and it's an incurable disorder, with early diagnosis and appropriate management, vision may be preserved for life. Okay. After this session, an email containing a survey link will be sent to you after answering the survey, your certificates will be sent to you as well. Please answer the survey so we can assess our webinar and address more of your preferences and give you materials from this session. Thank you for joining. Thank you. <laughs> so we would like to thank again our sponsor, Santen, and the Philippine Daily Inquirer and the Filipino Doctor for their support as our media partner. We hope to see you again in our upcoming webinar uh, on November November 23, Wednesday, 12 to 1 p.m. Manila time, uh, with speaker Dr. Homer Abia on adult vaccinations for herpes zoster and pneumococcus. Please invite your colleagues to join this continuing medical monthly CME webinar series for upcoming. For upcoming webinar schedules, you may check our Facebook page or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting the links written on your screen. For questions and comments, you may email us at uemetwebinars2016 at gmail.com. And if you missed some of our webinars, you may subscribe to our YouTube channel. On behalf of UPCM Class 1991 and the UP Medical Alumni Society, we also thank our collaborator units, the UP Medical Information Management Service, National Telehealth Center, UP Medi College of Medicine Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and Medical Informatics Units, uh, DOST ASDI, and Ms. Charisse Orhalo um, of The UP Medicine Webinar Team 2016 of the UP Class 1991 invites you again on November 23 for our next webinar uh, that will be Wednesday, 12 noon Manila time. Have a great week ahead. Thank you.